Um, next up, we have Christoph and Jakob speaking about confidential computing with Katka container. So the stage is yours. Have a fun. Hello, uh, so I'm Christophe de Dinochin. I'm working for Red Hat on OpenShift Sandbox containers, which is uh, the integration of Kata containers inside OpenShift. And we are just going uh, to release the product with OpenShift container platform for 10. Um, I'm also a grandfather for about one week now. So that's why I have a smile on my face. Jakob. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Jakob Nauke. Uh, I work in cloud development uh, for Linux and OpenShift uh, on IBM Z and Linux One uh, at IBM. I'm also active in the Kata containers and confidential containers uh, communities. Uh, and Christoph is going to kick it off. So, um, let me wait for the slides to show up. Yeah. When, uh, what are we going to cover today? Uh, the first question, the problem statement is why should a, a host in the cloud be able to see your data? And that's true in particular for data uh, in flight being processed, processed in memory. So a solution to that problem that is emerging is called confidential computing, and that includes encrypted virtualization that encrypts your memory on the fly. One aspect that impacts uh, the way we, we have to to deal with containers is in particular securing image downloads and attesting the workloads, which means essentially checking that you run what you think you, you are running and where you think you are running it. Now, this talk uh, is a continuation of a talk I gave at defconf.us last summer. And so I'm going to give a bit of a progress update since then. And Jacob is going to give us, to, so he's going to talk about attestation and uh, other technical aspects, but is also going to give us a demo of confidential computing running on IBM Z. So let me start with the problem statement. Can we trust the host? The answer, of course, is no. <clears throat> so your containers, your containers run on a host, which is often managed by a third party, like for instance, a cloud provider in the public cloud. And there are a number of sandboxing technologies that are used to isolate, for instance, the kernel from user space or create namespaces inside user space to isolate processes from one another. But all these sandboxing technologies only go one way. They protect the host from the containers. They don't go the other way around. So the resources uh, like CPU, memory, disk, networking, etc., belong to the host, which owns them and has practically free access. Your containers are really carved out of these host resources. Now, what do you need to do if you start considering the host as hostile? The, the problems that you can run in, into include first data exposure. That means the information held in the container can be seen by someone else. That makes it difficult to have multiple tenants on the same host because they may not want to share uh, information or have confidentiality risk with other containers. At the limit, this can pose legal concerns that preclude the use of containers if you cannot legally guarantee, guarantee your confidentiality. So the first enabling technology to address that is called confidential computing. This is a, a sort of umbrella term um, that covers many vendor-specific technologies uh, from AMD, Intel, IBM, uh, which has them both on S390 and Power, ARM, um, etc. All these technologies really rely on virtualization, but they work in a different way. And so uh, a product like Kala Containers has to really take uh, these differences into account. Now, confidential computing is more than just encryption. Of course, there is memory encryption that prevents the host from getting valid data out of guest memory. In other words, if you read your, your guest, you get only junk. But that's not enough. Um, integrated production is another important aspect that guarantees the host cannot corrupt the, state, the guest state. It cannot override the registers or it cannot inject malicious interrupts. <clears throat> 
And finally, an important aspect is attestation, which lets the guest owner, that we also call tenants, validate what runs in the guest and where it runs. So it knows that it's running on a trusted platform and it knows that the content it runs is the right one. The second enabling technology is Kata containers. So I don't know uh, who is familiar with Kata containers and I'm sorry for those of you who are, I'm waiting for the slide to show up. Okay. Now, um, and so what Kata containers does is essentially run containers that are described the usual way, for instance, the same kind of manifests, uh, the same kind of container images, the same storage setup, the same networking. But now these containers will run in virtual machines. There is one virtual machine per pod. And so that means they have their own independent kernel. And on top of that kernel, there is a very small, uh, very little user space, essentially just uh, something we call the Kata agents. So why do you want to do that? The, the idea is to get the ecosystem of containers, and that means rapid application de uh, development and deployment, while at the same time having the sandboxing of virtualization. Now, this was made possible because the original design for Kubernetes is quite modular. And um, so we have something called the container runtime interface that lets uh, Kubernetes dispatch to various runtimes. And so we, we essentially added a runtime for Kata. Um, and then you have other components that matter to us, like CNI, which is a container networking interface, and CSI, the container storage interface. So we also need to deal with, with that. We're going to see that in a minute. Now, let me talk a bit about the base, basic architecture, which is essentially running Kata container VMs on, a, on top of a confidential host. So I'm waiting for the slides to show up each time. Uh, so what we have to do is to separate the various trust reons uh, into platform, tenant, and host. So the trusted platform that is shown in red on the diagram offers confidentiality guarantees using typically hardware level cryptographic enforcement. So you can create trusted execution environments in it or TEE. The host environment will offer and manages all the resources that you need to run the containers that includes CPU, memory, IO, and so on. And finally, the tenancy includes everything in green on the diagram. And these are the confidential areas carved out of the, of the host and that are hidden from the host or not, not visible, nor accessible, nor uh, can be modified by it. Um, but it also includes, the tenancy also includes things that may run outside of the host uh, that we generally call relying party, and that includes services such as key brokering or attestation. I'm sorry, waiting for the slide again. So um, in order to enable confidential computing for Catapos, there are a number of impacted components. Uh, the runtime itself, the virtual machine monitor, the kernel, the firmware, and the hardware. And all of these pieces currently are moving. There is still work going on, for instance, at the firmware or kernel level for many of the platforms that I described earlier. Uh, so for the Kata runtime, of course, it starts with passing the right options to the virtual machine monitor. Then the virtual machine monitor will enable memory encryption and set up a, a protected VM. That requires some services from the kernel, in, part, in particular in the KVM component, uh, with low-level hardware support for technologies such as AMD STV or Intel TDX. And both guest and host firmware need to provide new special services, for instance, to validate the pages that you hand over to the guests these kind of things. And all that relies on hardware support, like having encryption in a memory controller or having a separate uh, processor to deal with cryptographic setup. So well, I, the point here is that we have a lot of moving parts and we have to deal with all of them at the same time. So this is a relatively complicated and long transition and that has been in progress for quite a while and I'm still waiting for the slides, sorry. So I'm, Speaking, okay. <laughs> uh, so the transition uh, to confidential containers um, started with enabling confidential computing when running virtual machines and doing a number of small API changes, uh, for example, to make sure that the host cannot see the guest log or execute dangerous com comments like uh, kubectl exec. So we started that uh, in a phase that we called CCV0. And I talked about this at the DEFCON.US talk.
So I'll refer you to these slides if you're interested. Now we, uh, we entered another phase called CCV1, where we are going to focus on pulling images um, that needs to be done by the guest to use encrypted images and make sure that the host doesn't see the images themselves. So that's more or less in progress at the moment. We also started working on the build NCI because those need to be adjusted quite significantly to be able to exercise code. Uh, we'll see a moment, in a moment why. Uh, and we are also working on, on really defining the threat model and making sure that this is uh, solid and documented. And there are a number of future topics that we are already working on or thinking about. Uh, I'm going to quickly brush over hot plugging for CPU and memory um, being incompatible with attestation and also with a model for administration where the tenant and host have to be uh, really separate. So <clears throat> the step that matters here at the moment is uh, image pooling. So in order to secure the image download, instead of downloading the images on the host, which is the way it's done traditionally, we need to put the images from inside the guest and to store them on some kind of encrypted volume where only the guest has decryption keys. And it, um, so this is possible because the kubelet in Kubernetes delegates the pool image operation to a service in the CI called image service. And during CCV0, what we had is we had some sort of ad hoc image pool from within the guest, but that used something that was similar to TMPFS, where we were essentially using or consuming guest memory, uh, which is an expensive resource to, to store container images. So the effort in CCV1 is to streamline uh, that aspect of things by developing a, a new component instead of re leveraging existing ones uh, called image RS where we are going to implement encrypted image storage locally on a, a, a transient volume that we are going to, to use for that occasion. Now, in order to, to use the images that we are going to download here, follow a standard for encrypted, uh, an OCI standard for encrypted images, and we need to adjust uh, to this new build. I'm sorry, I'm filling up there because the time it takes to go to the next slide is longer than I anticipated. So in order to build encrypted and signed images, the first step that you see in blue on the diagram here is more or less standard, where you, your developer will build some OCI image, and, um, and, and that image, uh, you, you, you want to transform it in such a way that it can no longer be used without a secret that is going to be provided later with mechanisms that Jacob is going to explain. Now, that OCI standard is still under development for encrypted image formats. So, so we, we are leveraging code that is a bit moving. <clears throat> but the important part here is that the build pipeline now really has two outputs. One that is shown in red here uh, goes to an image registry for encrypted images. And that's on unstructured, sorry, untrusted infrastructure. So you're protected by encryption, essentially. And, um, that's the, the thing that will be downloaded by your pod later. <clears throat> the other side goes in green, uh, following the green rows here, and it goes on trusted infrastructure. And that includes things like a key broker service, et cetera. So the diagram is simplified here. I'm just showing that we blindly hand over the keys. In reality, the, the exchange is much more complicated and Jacob is going to explain that in a minute. Now, <clears throat> One aspect of confidential computing that I mentioned is integrated production. And um, in order to explain the problem, you have to know that Kata Cleaners today relies on hot plugging quite a bit. So still waiting for the slide to show up. I'm, I apologize for this delay. <clears throat> How long does it take for the slide to show up? Okay, now you have it. So how do you configure your virtual machine? Well, today in Kata containers, uh, we use hot plugging to add memory, CPU, or devices to the pod. And this is, the reason for that is illustrated on the diagram on the right, where Kubernetes essentially sends us a pod creation request that tells us little about what is going to run inside the pod. And so we start the virtual machine with a fixed configuration, for instance, two gigabytes of memory and one CPU. <clears throat> 
And then when we get a description of the containers that you want to run inside, then we'll basically grow that VM, adding, for instance, 16 extra gigs of memory and eight more CPUs. Now, the problem is that integrity is quite hard to guarantee if you can change the configuration of your virtual machine at runtime. So if you, if you stick with existing APIs today, you would validate the small VM, but then when you try to extend it, it would fail uh, because it would change the, the hardware configuration and that's not acceptable in a confidential computing setup. So we are shifting towards something called immutable pods where we get extensions to the pod API so that we have a fully defined pod ahead of time before booting the virtual machine and our containers have enough space uh, and, and resources to run. Another, so that's, that's a bit of a future aspect. The API is being worked on at the moment, um, but that's a discussion with higher levels in the stack like uh, Kubernetes, CIO, et cetera. So another aspect, uh, it's incredible how long it takes for the slides to show up. I, I clicked, okay. So the, the need for a shadow control plane um, is, is um, it's, it's a future topic. It's something we started working on, but it's not going to be the NCCV one at all. Um, <clears throat> the problem is essentially that the tenants need to have some sort of isolated administrative realm to talk to their containers. For instance, to get the logs, to get container metrics, uh, to execute processes inside the container, et cetera. All these kind of things are really happening on the green side there. And so you have the, this sort of control plane uh, in green that uses different um, credentials than the one on the left in red, which the same person also needs. So these are host credentials, and you also need that to manage physical resources, so like creating your pod um, and allocating things like raw disks or getting hardware level metrics for the pod. So this is um, uh, essentially the, the, the model, the long-term model we are trying to shift towards. But that, of course, requires a lot of implication from the whole ecosystem around us, not just Kata containers. That's not something we can do in Kata containers or confidential containers alone. Um, and for, to, to, just to give you an example, when you use a, uh, a kubectl uh, comment, depending on the kind of comment that you run, you would need to go through the red or the green uh, one. If you create a container, then you would have some steps going on the left. Uh, if you uh, kubectl exec, then you would go on the right. Okay, so the next part of the talk is going to be um, uh, given by Jacob. Uh, while we shift to him presenting, I suggest that we take a few questions if there are any. And I stop sharing. If we don't have any question, I think Jacob can take over right away. Okay, then I'll take over right now, I guess. Um, we can we can have some, some questions later, maybe some more will come up. So uh, 18 minutes, I got plenty of time, wow. Um, so yeah, one, uh, again, my name is uh, Jakob Nauke. Uh, I work in cloud development for Linux and OpenShift on IBM Z and Linux One at IBM. Um, and I want to dig a little deeper uh, on attesting that a workload is secure, which is a very central problem in confidential containers or confidential computing in general. Um, I'm going to give a demo with a real world uh, trust execution environment. Um, and I'll talk about some more things that we have on the, on the future outlook. Um, so the, the central problem uh, really that you have to solve in confidential computing um, is making sure that the workload that you run is really running in a secure context. Like um, these these platforms, they all encrypt or protect uh, memory and CPU state in some way, and that's cool. But um, it's it's really only half the story uh, because when you, as a tenant, as a workload owner, want to run something, you you have to make sure that it was really started under that context. So if you were connecting to some allegedly secure domain at a cloud provider, for instance, you can't just take their word for it uh, that they're running it 
with uh, with the trust execution environment, um, and that is where where various methods of attestation uh, come in. So um, there are uh, pretty much two ways uh, that that we do this. Um, one is um, encrypting the boot image um, such that only the firmware can decrypt it in that secure context. Uh, and another way is remote attestation that happens at runtime or just before it. So um, these are these are these two uh, workflows. Um, in attestation, um, critical parts of the of the workload um, are measured. Um, and after a successful measurement, the relying party, which has to be active at runtime, um, can establish a secure channel into that confidential guest um, and provide any secrets that could then be used to, uh, I don't know, connect to some other endpoint uh, or whatever, but any secret that you can't that you can't put into the boot image unencrypted. Um, and the other uh, the other approach uh, for for ensuring that everything is running on tampered uh, is image encryption, where um, usually the direct boot components uh, like kernel and initrd and command line um, are uh, encrypted asymmetrically, um, such uh, that only the firmware has the the private key uh, to uh, to decrypt and launch that that boot image. Um, and um, it and such that it can only be read from in a secure context. So uh, that's that's where the security derives from uh, with the with the image encryption workflow. That the that simply the the firmware keys um, can only be read by firmware. Um, and if we were, for instance, running a running attestation uh, with the cater agent um, you would have um, you know the the environment host firmware and kernel and a vmm such as qemu um, and you'd have your your confidential vm uh, with its firmware and kernel and uh, an init rd that contains the cater agent um, and the the stack below the confidential vm would be measured by firmware um, and the relying party could attest uh, that that this um, the setup hasn't been tampered with, and then it can inject further secrets. Uh, for instance, uh, when an image is pulled in, then uh, an encrypted image it can decrypt that image and provide the key for it. Um, there are um, more or less two ways of uh, of running attestation. Um, one is pre-attestation, um, where the VM is measured uh, before starting it. Um, and the other is attestation that happens completely at runtime, where the VM is measured not only uh, at start, but uh, can also be measured down the road, depending on what exactly you can do. Uh, with these with these measurements, um, pre-attestation is used, for instance, by um, first and second generation AMD SEV and SEV ES. Um, complete runtime attestation is used by Intel's upcoming TDX or the third generation uh, AMD SEV SNP. Um, and one one nice thing about uh, remote runtime attestation uh, is that uh, a vulnerable image um, can can be uh, invalidated uh, if there were some known vulnerability uh, down the road, at least as far as that measurement goes. Um, in the boot image encryption based workflow, um, there would be some secret pre-provisioned uh, into the init RD. Um, which can then be used to bootstrap other uh, secrets, like it might be it might be a key uh, for decrypting container images uh, with uh, with CATA containers. Um, but um, yes, this is this is pretty much the the alternative to to attestation, um, where the the guest image is encrypted asymmetrically. And it's ensured by firmware that can only be decrypted in in these in these trust execution environments. Um, one nice property of uh, the encryption based workflow is that the relying party 
uh, does not need to be active uh, at runtime. So you could run this uh, basically fully offline if you wanted. Um, and this this encryption based workflow is, for instance, what uh, IBM's uh, secure execution or power protected execution facility do. Um, and now I've I've introduced a couple of workflows. Uh, they differ in more fundamental and less fundamental ways. They're all sort of sort of vendor uh, dependent. Um, and obviously, we didn't want to write confidential containers uh, from start to finish. Um, for, for each of these technologies, um, which is why we went uh, with a modularized approach um, with a confidential container zone component uh, that we call the attestation agent, um, which is another binary that uh, exists next to the catter agent or other agents hypothetically uh, inside the guest init RD. Um, and it, well, like I said, it uses it uses modules um, that um, that support these varying um, methods of attestation and encryption um, to provide some secrets at runtime. For instance, for decrypting container images. So yeah, this is the the, the catter agent and the attestation agent um, with with varying uh, modules. Uh, depending on the confidential computing technologies, um, so from pretty much from start to finish, uh, what we what we have now, uh, that would be you you start uh, a confidential container uh, with kubelets. So yeah, these are all standard OCI components pretty much, um, and you would then use a container runtime interface, uh, runtime like container D. Um, we uh, are currently running some cost, custom modifications uh, with container D, um, especially because of the guest image pull. That's something that derives from the uh, regular workflow, which is why we're using some, some modifications there. But there are efforts uh, to bring those modifications or at least functionally similar modifications back to upstream. Um, and container D would then talk to uh, Shim, a a runtime binary, a runtime host binary, if you will. Uh, so this is similar in functionality to run C or C run, if you're aware of those. Uh, but it's it's the cat shim, um, and that will launch a confidential VM with the boot image that it has, for instance, via QEMU, and would in the inside the confidential VM, the guest component, the cat agent, is started. And the shim, the runtime shim, uh, can then talk to the agent um, over a restricted API that Christoph alluded to, um, or at least in in confidential containers, it's restricted. Uh, and um, yeah, the the confidential containers compatible Kata agent can then pull an image uh, from a container image registry, um, which for confidentiality would have to be encrypted. Um, so this this is a sort of standardized way of um, of encrypting container images, and um, it would then uh, retrieve a key uh, from the attestation agent uh, that I mentioned, and the attestation agent would um, get that key from the relying party, um, depending on technology at at runtime or or ahead of time. Um, but if if it, such technologies are used, the the guest is measured and the secret key. Uh, is provisioned into the guest, um, and then then you can run and then you can run a container. Um, the it's it's unpacked. We're currently using Umochi for repacking, and then uh, you're running a a confidential uh, VM that functions as a as a container pod basically, um, and since. I'd like to show a bit uh, of, of what is already working. Uh, I'd like to demo this uh, with a real uh, trusted execution uh, environment, uh, which is IBM Secure Execution uh, for Linux, incidentally, the platform that I work for, um, which uh, is for IBM Z and Linux One. Um, in kernel terms, that's the S390X architecture. 
uh, traditionally known as the mainframe. Uh, but uh, yeah, we can we can use Linux and OpenShift and such technologies uh, on on IBM Z. And um, like I alluded to before, um, Secure Execution uses the encrypted image workflow. Um, I'd like to present a little how that works in general before we get to confidential containers. So uh, in a in a traditional uh, Secure Execution based workflow, um, you would have um, some existing VM uh, on trusted hardware uh, with QEMU and KVM. Um, you would have initrd kernel command line and a um, normal Linux root FS uh, encrypted with Lux, and the initrd would have the key uh, to that Lux, um, so it can launch uh, without any um, interaction. And um, what what you would then do as a secure guest uh, workload owner is you would generate a protected, a, an encrypted image um, out of that initrd in kernel command line. Um, and that, that, gives you, that gives you a secure execution uh, compatible image. Um, and that is encrypted uh, with a public key. And the private key is serial number specific uh, to, uh, to the host. Um, and can only be read uh, in in a context that's that's already uh, that's already secure, and that's how that image is decrypted. And then you can also decrypt the root FS and everything. Um, and yeah, the the header is also integrity protected and supports uh, several public keys. If you wanted to run one image on several machines, for instance, these are, these things are all possible. Um, and so yeah. Um, Secure execution is basically one platform that uh, sort of sidesteps uh, the need for, for for runtime at a station. Um, there is no component required uh, at runtime here, uh, no external component. Um, so the direct boot components are just encrypted asymmetrically, and the private keys for that are are in firmware. Um, one one challenge that this imposes, obviously, uh, is that you can't just make uh, these uh, these host keys, these private host keys, uh, readable to to the hypervisor or really to software in in general. Because if uh, if it were readable to them, then it would be readable to a rogue cloud provider, for instance, and then you haven't then you haven't really gained anything. Um, and that is where, uh, in security execution, uh, the so-called ultravisor uh, comes in. The ultravisor is implemented in hardware and firmware um, and manages uh, the guest memory pages. Um, so um, the, the, the guest memory cannot be read by the hypervisor, cannot be read by KVM, cannot be read by other uh, processes. Um, or um, or also one confidential guest um, to the next. That would of course also be important if you were running if you were running multi-tenant. Um, so to to get a little into what what ultravisor and hypervisor do, um, hypervisor uh, will reboot uh, to the ultravisor once once it detects a secure execution uh, kernel. Um, and from then on out, uh, the ultravisor will ensure protection of, of memory and state, um, which means that memory pages are encrypted uh, when they're swapped out uh, or dumped. Uh, and when they're, they're swapped back, then they're also checked for integrity. Um, and IO and scheduling are still hypervisor managed. Um, so especially IO should still be encrypted. You should still use uh, at rest encryption with the LUX uh, that I showed, for instance, um, or, or secure your network connections, obviously. Um, memory is in the current generation, not physically encrypted. So it's not encrypted on the die, um, but it is encrypted when, uh, when read uh, through software. Um, but for the next generation um, CPU for uh, for Z and Linux one uh, memory encryption uh, has been announced. Um, and one challenge that we face uh, in secure execution that is also partially faced by other uh, technologies, which Christoph alluded to, is uh, that we don't have don't really have runtime memory updates as of now. So S390X is not a DIM-based architecture, so no DIM hot swapping. Uh, Vert IMM support is is incomplete, and uh, secure execution does also not have ballooning support uh, yet. 
Um, but anyway, to get back to uh, to confidential containers, uh, how we integrate this with the attestation agents of this component that um, supports various uh, technologies, um, we uh, currently use what I like to call the bake-in approach, um, which is pretty much akin to the Lux workflow that I showed earlier. So for encrypted container image, um, there are just offline keys inside the guest um, encrypted by the host key. Um, which uh, which can then be used to to decrypt um, to decrypt container images. Um, this is pretty simple uh, because it uh, doesn't require uh, any external components at runtime. Would also work air gapped, um, and I'd like to because that's um, what's what's working right now. Uh, I'd like to uh, demo that um, in a quick recording because I'm not taking any risks. So let me switch the sharing here to that video it's here. Um, uh, so what, what, what we've got here is um, we're on a secure execution capable node and we have a normal Kubernetes uh, deployment um, YAML file. So yeah, pretty much, pretty much standard components. Um, and we're using uh, Kata as our runtime and we're specifying uh, this Docker IO Kata Docker CCV0 SSH um, image for S390X um, to be used as our image, the confidential containers version zero SSH demo. Um, and this image is encrypted, which is important because it contains a private host key. Um, and that um private ssh host key and um yeah like you can't launch it with docker or anything you can also check that that image is is really encrypted um so in container d uh, we configure kata as a runtime and we configure uh, a configuration for kata which among other things uh has uh that secure boot image that protected image uh that i mentioned before uh specified as kernel so it doesn't only contain the kernel, also contains the init RD with Kata. Um, and now, as we um, as we apply this this YAML file and start the pod, um, it takes a short while because the um, because the image has to be pulled. Um, but uh, once it's there, now it's there. Um, when we run a uh, queue called Lixec, for instance, this is where the restricted API comes in. If I were if I were a rogue admin. Um, I could do some some evil things here, perhaps. Uh, but as you can see, this this uh, request is blocked, uh, which is uh, which is important uh, for for ensuring uh, confidentiality. Um, and um, what we what you would do instead to connect uh, to connect to this guest is you would use um, SSH with the private key. And now as I set a secret in there, I'm gonna set it to very secret data. Um, and I exit, I'm going to run a grep on the confidential data that I just set on a pipe. Um, and we're going to run a SOCAT uh, to, to QMP, the, the Kimu socket. Um, and we're going to run dump guest memory uh, to that uh, to that pipe, and what will happen now is uh, that uh, the ultravisor will give us all these pages, uh, but they're going to be uh, encrypted, um, and that is why uh, the confidential data um, will not be will not be seen uh, from from that grep. Um, so th that that is basically a a small demo of, uh, of of the confidentiality. Because if I did this with a uh, with a regular uh, VM-based container, um, this this data would show up here. Um, so to get back to the slides, um, to get back to the slides, um, we uh, I'd like to say a few things about um, ongoing and future work because we are still at uh, at B zero um, with uh, with confidential containers. Um, first of all. Um, Secure execution uh, and the attestation agent. I'd like to increase flexibility a little by um, using a TLS certificate inside the guest and bootstrap a secure connection to the relying party at runtime. Um, so you lose the air gap functionality, um, but uh, you can, for instance, uh, provide more 
um, guests uh, keys more uh, more content their decryption keys or certificates um, at runtime as you please um, I'd also uh, like to find some alternatives to to native end-to-end -end tenant builds especially for secure execution um, so on on the left side here um, you you have to build the guest end-to-end -end right now um and this is might especially be slightly annoying um if you need a uh, trusted um ibmz or linux one hardware just to do that um so cross compilation uh, would be nicer there um so that a native instance is not required and i've i've begun work on this and some things work uh, but um that's uh, that's still under construction and then on the right side, it's uh, it's a more uh, general, uh, probably business focused topic um, that would that would be getting getting provision built. So you might not trust uh, your your cloud provider, for instance, uh, to never tamper at runtime, uh, but you might trust them uh, to build the correct image for you, or you might trust a distribution uh, to build the correct image for you. And if you could. Um, provide uh, secrets uh, through Addis Asian, for instance, um, at runtime, um, then, then that would also be an option so that you as a workload owner uh, wouldn't have to build uh, so many things. And we could um, also probably increase trust uh, with, uh, with reproducible builds there. Um, so uh, just to reiterate a little on the attestation uh, process uh, that I showed earlier, the enhancements that we want to do, and I'm going to switch back and forth here, um, are um, supporting Containerd and Cryo on the left. Um, so Cryo, we're not supporting at this time, and Containerd has some custom, custom modifications. Um, those are still to be brought back upstream. Um, then uh, the image services uh, inside the Cater agent uh, should be enhanced. Um, we want to skip using Yamochi uh, for repacking because we're not really using a huge part of it. Um, and we're going to use a fully rustified uh, image workflow there. Um, the container images that we're running right now um, are not uh, checked, are not authenticate, authenticated yet. Um, so authentication um, and certificates are uh, are still an area that we're that we're discussing uh, right now, which is going to be especially interesting for um, for running unencrypted sidecars um, that are merely signed. Um, and we would also uh, like to enhance uh, secure, uh, uh, we would also like to enhance confidential containers um, with ephemeral uh, block devices uh, that would also have to be encrypted, of course. Um, so that, uh, for instance, um, this, this might expand into ways of using less memory or to uh to reusing downloaded images so they don't have to be downloaded uh, every time um so yeah these these are the things uh we're looking into uh we're on github uh we're on slack you can join us you can test this um if you have a te you can test this uh, with secure execution um amd sev first gen um eaa from Inclaver containers alibaba um we also have a generic demo um, that you can use just to just to try it out. It won't be confidential if you don't have a real TE, but um, just just to to get an idea of the workflow. Um, but um, yeah, otherwise, uh, thank you for the attention, and we're now uh, open for questions. Oh yes, uh, th thank you, Fabiano. Yes, uh, besides besides the Slack and GitHub, uh, we also have we also have uh, regular uh, meetings uh, right now with confidential containers. Uh, these are on uh, on Thursdays, um, um, and I'm 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 going to post a link. Um, Francois, a great presentation. Is there a dependency in the architecture uh, on the use of TPM? No, um, generally not. So so TPM. Uh, is is another uh, trusted computing technology that uh, doesn't really work in the same way uh, that those uh, that we discussed. Um, 
the the runtime attestation uh, methods uh, depend on um, on having secure uh, platforms inside uh, inside the guest, like uh, the AMD platform security processor uh, or the Intel management engine. As far as I'm aware, um, the uh, the TPM is is more or less uh, orthogonal. Um, you can also um, achieve um, specific uh, guarantees uh, about uh, about remote attestation. Um, there is the key lime project for instance uh, but that's uh, not what we cover in confidential containers which is specifically confidential vms but good question the, the, there are some similarities in the now i have the code again uh, there are quite some similarities regarding the uh, the way measurements are performed and the general principles and also it's quite likely that if you want to ensure uh, some kind of confidentiality when you deploy that on real hardware you probably use the tpm on the host but that's a completely something that the hardware owner would have to deal with use of i think you talked about tmima right yes so the device mapper um also has uh an, a, an attestation uh process being put in place uh, this solves a different problem however uh we are discussing with the developers to see if there is an opportunity for instance to create an image download mechanism that would take advantage of that and for instance could allow us to have nice properties in terms of having an image that is compressed um, can be downloaded in a sparse way. In other words, you only download the pieces that you actually use and where each block is attested and uh, signed. So these are properties that you can get from the device mapper. However, this is completely independent or and actually incompatible with the OCI image format. So whether we actually take advantage of that uh, in the long run, uh, remains to be seen, but at least there are discussions in go uh, ongoing. So there's a question about if you encrypt the image, is there still value in signing the image? So yes, there is still value uh, in verifying the integrity of the whole image. The encryption actually happens layer by layer and uh, per layer key. Uh, so you, uh, you also need to validate the integrity of the whole package making sure that, for instance, there is not a missing layer somewhere in the middle. And the other reason is that we may want to include in the container image a few layers that are not encrypted because they are completely standard. So if you base on top of something that is just a basic distro or something like that, these layers might not be encrypted, but you want to sign them. Yeah, uh, sidecars are another are another use case for this. Uh, like maybe you even have uh, just a, a single layer encrypted image that contains some secret, uh, and that's cool. Um, but you might want to run a sidecar uh, that is just um, that is just signed uh, but not encrypted because it's a, a standard component, um, and then you would want to to check that for validity so that no one can um, can launch uh, an uh, an unauthorized sidecar in your in your TE that would that would be not so great, um, and that's something that that we're working now, on. Sorry, there is a question. I mentioned that we are discussing the the whole threat model, and one of the discussions that came up is whether we can actually provide sufficient security if we have a signed container image 
when none of the layers is animated. And the reason is because we, uh, so some part of our security model rely on actually having to use some secrets. And if you don't use any secret, then maybe there is a weakness that we're still exploring that. Thank you for your questions, Francois. Um, we're officially at time. Um, if there is a quick question, uh, maybe we can still fit that in. Otherwise, um, I'd like to thank you for your questions and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you from our side too. This is very interesting topic and I think a really up to date uh, with the security, especially in the container world. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, um, I see that you already shared some uh, contact. If someone would like to keep move forward with you, your teams, uh, and just in case, I think you are going to move to Discord if someone wants to move forward. So I wish you a good rest of the day, a great weekend, and uh, see you soon. <laughs>